The all-electric crossover is becoming one of the most competitive category of new vehicle. There's the Tesla Model Y, Mustang Mach-E, Hyundai Ioniq 5, many more in that category available today, and many soon to come. One of the newer entries from a lesser known brand at this point is the Genesis GV60. Genesis is Hyundai's luxury vehicle division, so this car takes a lot of what's good about Hyundai's new electric offerings, improves certain things, and leaves others to be desired. Today I'm going to review the Genesis GV60, talk about the good and the bad in my experience, and see how it compares to close competitors in its category, so let's get into it. Also a big thanks to Tom and his wife for letting me borrow and review their GV60. The Genesis GV60 is a compact crossover SUV, seating five comfortably and coming in right about 178 inches long. For quick comparison, that's about nine inches shorter than a Tesla Model Y. It's compact, but since it's all electric, it packs a lot of comfort and space inside such a small package. It starts at $59,290 and packs a lot of premium features and design, which can make this stand out from other options on the market. It gets a range up to 248 miles on a 77.4 kilowatt hour battery and zero to 60 as low as 3.7 seconds in the performance model, depending on who is testing it. Today I'm reviewing the all wheel drive version, which is a slower zero to 60. Overall, it has a lot of what you want in an electric car. From the outside, it has four standard doors with handles that present themselves as you approach with the key fob, an automatic hatch in the rear, front trunk opened like a normal hood, and charge port door. In my experience with this car, the handles worked great, but but I did find it confusing as to when I was allowed to open the rear hatch and when it was locked. I think that has to do with the car's start stop button, which we'll talk more about in a minute. The GV60 has a very distinct design, similar to the Ionic 5, but rounded out significantly. It looks really nice from the front with the headlights, although I sometimes worry that this car may be judging me a bit. In any case, it looks particularly good from the rear with the taillights and brake light bar that light up on the spoiler. There are also some interesting trim lines on the exterior like the chrome zigzag in the rear on both sides. On top of the car, there isn't a full glass roof, but there is a nice sunroof. As for space inside, there are five comfortable seats. There are your standard two seats up front with pretty standard adjustments, but there is an impressive amount of leg room that you notice as a passenger. One funny thing to note here is that the passenger seat has adjustments on the side of it. This is typically a control so that rear passengers can put this seat forward for more legroom when nobody is sitting there, but it's unclear why these adjustments are on the seats in this rather small car. I imagine it's just something kids will end up playing with and parents will get frustrated about. Stop playing with the seat. In the rear, there are three seats and these can fold in a classic 60-40 pattern. The rear seats also have a very wide range of recline flexibility, which is nice to have and would be great on a longer road trip in the back. There are also built-in sunshades for the rear seats that can be put up or taken down manually along with cup holders in each door. There are the vents for rear passengers and USB-C ports for rear passengers as well. I'm glad to see that these are USB-C since they're weirdly USB-A on the Ionic 5. The middle seat folds down as a cup holder armrest as needed. Up front there is storage in the center console, both under the armrest and under the console itself, which is actually completely hollow. It passes through from the front to the rear and can hold whatever you need. There's also another storage spot in front, and I personally like the way that the center console doesn't extend all the way to the floor. It feels more roomy that it passes through between the front seats. In addition to pockets in the doors and cup holders, there's the glove box, which might be one of the biggest glove boxes on the market since it's a slide out drawer. This is pretty nice to have and feels much more useful than the typical glove box. In the rear, the GV60 has a hatchback trunk, but this space is pretty small overall because of the size of this car. There's a little bit of under storage space here with that cover able to lift in multiple ways, but since the roof is so sloped in this car, that trunk space can end up smaller than it may seem. However, when needed, the rear seats can fold nearly flat. This allows for longer cargo as needed and gives the small car a lot of versatility. Also in the back is a 12 volt outlet for whatever you may need to plug in. The one complaint here is that while a lot of this car feels luxurious, the rear seats are entirely manual and must be folded manually with the handles on each side. A number of other EVs competing have the ability to fold seats from the rear with switches or buttons on the top of the seat, so that seems like a miss to me. That said, I really do like the recline options you have with the rear seats. Up front is the front trunk, and just as the case with the Kia EV6 and Hyundai Ionic 5, it's essentially non-existent. The front trunk opens with a latch from inside, just like a standard hood, and inside there's a very 
very small box that you can store something like a charging cable in. It's nice to have for certain things you don't need to access often, but can hardly be considered a front trunk when compared to other options on the market. One other feature worth mentioning on the exterior of the GV60 is the facial recognition camera. This is located on the pillar for the front door and you can configure it to see your face and let you into your car in case you don't want to bring a key with you or don't have it. Additionally, inside there is a fingerprint sensor that will let you drive the car. So instead of a phone key or key fob, you could opt to use your face and fingerprint. Kind of an unnecessary feature, but fun thing to have in this car. Instead of a glass roof, the GV60 has a large sunroof, around twice the size of a typical one, and it's nice to have the option to electronically open or close the cover for the roof as needed. That said, the glass roof isn't contributing much to headroom or the feeling of headroom since it's often covered. Inside is the driver, the GV60 has two main things going on. For one, it has a lot of buttons, which may be what you want or not. If you're into Tesla levels of simple interior, this is going to be overwhelming, but it may be welcoming to those who don't want to deal with a screen all the time. Secondly, it has a lot of premium materials. For the most part, this car feels luxurious and feels like a car in its price range. The steering wheel feels great, seats are comfortable, doors have great materials, and everything is built incredibly well. I have no complaints for the build of this car whatsoever. It delivers what it should in regards to quality. My only complaint might be with the headliner, which felt like something from a cheaper vehicle like the Ionic 5 it's based on. As a driver, this is your main view. You have two main screens and then a third small screen for climate controls. So the screens on the Genesis GV60 are exactly the same as the Kia EV6 and the Hyundai Ionic 5, and that's because they're all built on the same platform. You have the two screens that interface together. This one is your static gauge cluster. You can change things on it, but it's definitely not a touchscreen. But this one is a touchscreen, and it is very responsive. I'm definitely noticing that. But for the most part, it's very similar to the Ionic 5. When you go to maps, for me, it is not a great mapping system. This feels very dated, so you're definitely going to want to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, which are both included. But on screen, you have EV, map, destination, phone projection, which is how you would do CarPlay or Android Auto. Voice Memos is an interesting app. You have your setup, and this is a kind of cool thing that only this car has, 3D setup. So there's a lot of menus on screen and a lot of physical buttons that you kind of have to learn. So this menu is called 3D Setup, and it lets you just tap whatever you want to set up and figure it out. So I click See Inside. It's going to take me inside, and then I can tap the exact thing that I'm wanting to configure, and it's going to take me to that menu. So See Outside. Now I can go outside and decide that I want to change lights. So it brings me to my light settings. And I think when I click back, does it go back to 3D setup, which is very nice. I can change door slash lift gate settings here. Heads up display was actually something I was really happy to find the menu for because I noticed it was a little crooked, but you can totally dial that in. So right here, I have the rotation fixed a little bit and I lowered the height a bit because it kept getting chopped off for my height in this car and I'm only 5'10", so it would definitely be a problem for other people, but you can definitely dial that in here. Overall, it's a very nice responsive display, but for the most part, I don't feel like you're gonna be using the features it comes with all that much. So it's good that it's responsive, but for the most part, you'll probably be in the Android Auto or Apple CarPlay world. And here is the home screen. If you just completely go to home, it's really not that much information. I kind of wish there was more here, but it does have that. So the gauge cluster right here, for the most part, is gonna stay this way. It's gonna have all the info that you wanna have, and you can change this card on the right side with the button on the steering wheel. I can just choose to make it disappear. I can click it to customize and scroll through a few different things. Press and hold to open, and then you can swipe between different cars to see tire pressure, see your next navigation steps, all that stuff on this screen. But then what's kind of a double benefit here is that not only do you have this screen right in front of you with your speed and everything, but you have a heads up display and you can customize exactly what info that's showing. I'm actually finding that to be pretty nice. And then this screen right here is actually your third screen, and this is for climate controls. Now, some people don't like climate controls being on screen, but it's not really on screen here. There are things you can tap, but for the most part, there's physical buttons that this is interfacing with. Like this sync button is an actual physical button I can touch to sync the climate, or I can have individual for each side. But as much as there is a lot of screen happening, there are a lot of buttons in this car. So if you love that, then this will be great for you. If you want a more minimal approach to not a lot of buttons and things being handled on screen, this car might not be the one for you because there's a lot of stuff and it's a lot to figure out at first. Volume controls are down here and there's also a button for your fingerprint if you need to get into the car that way. This is where you can also tune the radio, press home, menu back. Then there's also navigation and media buttons at the bottom of the climate screen here. You have other options 
options and other buttons like volume on the steering wheel as well as well as drive modes and all of your kind of self-driving stuff. The paddles back here are what adjust your regen braking settings. You have two different stocks. There's a bunch of buttons on the side here including this joystick that you dial in your mirrors with. And then right here below this shifter that's kind of like a little orb that flips around, there's also the heated seat buttons and certain parking buttons. And then there's of course the EV start stop button which this car has. On the steering wheel, there are multiple buttons that relate to driver assist features, buttons for media controls, calls, a button to switch drive modes, and a touch button that adjusts options on the gauge cluster display. In the performance model, there's an extra boost button on the lower right of this steering wheel. If you need to adjust the steering wheel location, there's a button for this on the back left of the wheel. This location actually makes a lot of sense to me and is hidden until you need it. There are buttons for driver profile settings on the door, window buttons, lock buttons, and a door handle. There are also buttons to open the trunk and Engage the parking brake and more. On the center console are media control buttons, that fingerprint sensor I mentioned earlier, a wheel for controlling options on screen without touching the screen, the gear shifter, and seat heating options among others. Then on the headliner there are more buttons for safety features as well as the sunroof cover open close. One particular thing I'm glad to see in this car which I think is missed in a Tesla is a handle. Not only are there overhead handles as needed, but the doors have easy areas to grab to open and close. Once you are ready to drive you'll need the key fob to be with you. This fob, even with a pretty normal size, has eight buttons on it, controlling certain parking features, the charge port, horn, trunk open, and of course, unlock and lock. However, just having this on you will unlock the car on approach. Then when you get in, you press the brake and press the start stop button to turn on this car. When this happens, you'll see the glass orb on the center console flip 180 degrees to reveal the gear shifter. I actually kind of like this orb. It's funny, looks pretty cool, and is satisfying to control. However, it is something I'd be worried about braking long term since it's going to flip over every single time I start the car and flip back when the car is turned off. I wonder if long Long term dirt would end up building up inside and end up jamming to where I can't actually access my shifter. Could be a non-issue, but it seems like a moving part on a pretty essential control. One reason I do like this orb though is that it clearly shows me when the car is turned on fully. I've driven a lot of electric cars at this point and the start stop button is something I want to see disappear. It's easy enough to get used to, but it's something that doesn't even need to exist on an electric car. There's no engine to start when you press start and it ends up just locking certain features unless the car is fully on and it doesn't really need to be that way. Tesla's Rivian's Lucid's and others operate without this button and it makes it a much more seamless experience to get in and drive. For me it just ends up pretty confusing because it's really hard to tell when the car is on or off and that's where that orb comes in handy for me because I can look right there and see if the gear shifter is shown then that means the car is fully on. I won't talk about that for too long though because it's something we'll see at least for some time with EVs from legacy automakers adapting certain technology from gasoline vehicles. The Ionic 5 has it so the GV60 built on the same platform has it as well. So let's take it for a drive. So now that I'm in the GV60, I'm gonna take it for a drive. So I have to put my foot on the brake and press the EV start stop button. If you don't put your foot on the brake, the orb isn't gonna flip for you to shift gears. And then I can shift into drive and let's go for it. Right now it's on regen level three and there's four different levels. So I can change it on the wheel once I'm going straight and can access the button. So this is regen level zero. So this feels like a completely normal gas vehicle. It's not doing any sort of regen braking. And to me, this is not comfortable because I'm used to a lot of regen braking. Um, but then there's four different versions of this. So I can go into level one, level two, level three, and then max, which is called iPedal. And that's your one pedal driving. In my opinion, if you're driving an electric car, this is definitely the best way to do it. So. Ooh, right. okay, gotta turn that off. Okay. So here's a good example of how it can be kind of tough in this car to figure something out in the menus. And this is totally something you can just learn. But right now it's doing voice for our navigation. And I actually don't want that because I want to be able to talk. And I'm having quite the time trying to figure that out. So I'm going to go into like general settings, navigation, um, display. I assume it would be in guidance, but when I went down to navigation voice guidance. The only option I have is to end the navigation voice guidance upon approaching the destination. So I can't turn it off there. Navigation auto features, no. And it's not the volume. I tried turning down volume and turning off the radio entirely. It's not connected to that. Okay, so I'll go to sound settings. Wait, navigation volume, use map screen volume buttons. Okay, where? <laughs> All right, I figured it out. You swipe up on the map screen and then I should have some options here. Beeps, sounds, 
I'm just gonna turn that all the way down. There's where it is. It's a voice if you wanna turn off the voice. Right now I'm gonna switch into reverse and show you both a positive and negative. So I go into reverse, and on screen here we have an overhead 360 view as well as the backup camera. And that's great. I really love the overhead 360 view. And you can also move this one around. You can kind of go all over the car. Uh, I don't know how entirely necessary this is beyond just the overhead view, but it's there and it does do a pretty good job. It's especially cool that you can legitimately see your entire surroundings and it's live. So if there was some crazy parking maneuver you needed to do, uh, this would help out a lot. Now that's the positive. The negative is that when I go into reverse now, I pedals off. So I've been driving this car with I pedal on and I had this complaint with the Ionic 5, but I wasn't sure if there was a setting or something that I could dial this in with, and there's not. So if you're driving with regen braking all the time, you're used to one pedal driving, and then you go into reverse, and you're two pedal driving 100%. So right here, my foot is off the brake, I'm in drive, and then I'm gonna press the accelerator, go a little bit, let off, and I come to a stop. Versus, I go into reverse now, and the car just starts rolling backwards. Uh, I think that is something that it could potentially be a safety issue that they should definitely fix with an over-the-air software update and should be able to just let you be in iPedal all the way across the board. So my first impressions driving this are that it's a lot like the Ionic 5, which makes a lot of sense, but it's a little tighter and feels a little better and the power just feels a little nicer and also the ride quality. The ride quality is better than the Ionic 5 and it's also better than the Model Y. It's not like a ton better, but you can feel the difference. I'm going over a pretty bumpy, like repaired parking lot right now, and it absorbs it really well. Another thing you'll notice when driving that's really nice on the gauge cluster display is the blind spot cameras that come up on turn signal. Now, a lot of cars, including Teslas, have this, but it's over here, and it's really nice to have it on the gauge cluster pop up, and it responds really well. I drove the Lucid Air, and at that time, at least, the uh, software that was pretty slow. Uh, the blinker, it would take a couple seconds for it to pop up. And now with this car, it's great. So let's just give it a little bit of power here. Yeah, that is very good. <laughs> it doesn't feel quite as responsive as a Tesla does in both steering and power, but it's definitely great. I would be very happy to drive this car. It's also very quiet in here. Probably the combination of great build quality as well as the suspension are helping with that. I also don't have any kind of low rumble in the back. This is definitely quieter than my car is. But yeah, I'm going around some pretty windy kind of mountainy roads right now and it's responding really well. The regen braking works really great, exactly how you'd want. The only time I've noticed it being a little odd is when you're coming to a stop. It's not quite the same as Tesla's hold mode and steering is great, really nice car to drive. Like right there, coming to this stop, I think I would have been able to fully stop without using the brakes there in other electric cars, but I wasn't able to in this one. So this has the same basic steering wheel and same basic options as other cars that are on this same platform. So there's this drive mode button right here. And I'm curious when I change it, uh, how that works, because one complaint I had with the Ionic 5, which I'm assuming is gonna be the same here, is that when you change drive modes while you're already driving, it changes instantly. So if your pedal is this far down and on sport, that means much faster, it's immediately gonna speed up. And I don't agree with that. I think it should wait to completely change until you're pressing the pedal again. But that's how these are designed. But yeah, there's three drive modes, eco, comfort, and sport. Eco, of course, is essentially a chill mode and it's gonna be the best for range. Comfort is gonna be what is best for comfort and sport is gonna be giving it all the power that it has. So now I'm getting out of the freeway and I am in sport mode. So I'm gonna try out both sport and self-driving features. Let's punch it. Yeah, it's pretty good. This isn't the uh, performance model top of the line, but it gives you plenty of power. I think that's gonna be a, a thing with a lot of electric cars is people are gonna be comparing zero to 60s and saying, this car isn't as fast as this other car, but once it gets to a certain point, it is plenty and it's gonna be just what you need to aggressively lane change, speed up if you need it. So comparing the interior quality of this car to other cars, on the software side, I would say something like a Tesla is better. It's a lot more up-to-date software, it feels a lot more modern, and it makes a little more sense. You're not gonna get super lost in menus, at least I don't think so. But from the interior perspective, certain things in this do feel better. Some of the materials, it feels nicer, more plush, uh, feels a little more like what you're paying for. 
But at the same time, the seat I'm in is all right. I've been working on adjusting it a bunch and playing with the lumbar support and such. And I haven't really noticed it being that incredible. Also things like the rear trunk space, this car is definitely smaller and you can feel it in that trunk space. For the self-driving features of this car, I believe there are four different buttons you're gonna be working with. One is the cruise control button, one is the following distance button, one is the auto steer button or whatever they may call it, and then one is your speed button. And that's a switch that goes up and down. So right now I'm gonna enter cruise control. So it's doing a following distance of one. I'm actually gonna change that to a little further. You can do one through four. I'm gonna to go to three and see what that's like. It should automatically brake for the car in front of me. And I am steering currently. Yeah, it's doing a good job. Did a nice job braking for that slowdown. I'm in some stop and go traffic, which is actually a situation I like to test these in because certain cars like Teslas are all right in stop and go traffic, but can really slam on the brakes and then accelerate really quickly. Uh, Rivian is actually really good in stop and go traffic. So I'm curious to see what this is like. Now I'm gonna enter auto steer on top of this. So it should be, okay, now I have a green wheel. It's showing me on the heads up display that it's steering for me. And one difference between this and Tesla's autopilot is this, you do have to prove that you're there. It's not with a camera and it's not with turning force, but it's with pressure on the wheel. So all of the information about what is happening with self-driving is on the main gauge cluster, but it's also on the heads up display in front of me. And it's actually pretty nice to see it right there on the road. So I just realized it's not going above the speed limit because when I clicked into it, it's not locking to the speed limit, it's locking to what your current speed is. So it's telling me to keep my hands on the wheel and my hands are on the wheel. There we go. I've heard that can be a little more touchy because you do have to kind of squeeze the wheel. All right, so I'm gonna change lanes here myself. It's one thing worth mentioning is there's no feature for auto lane change here. Technically there is in a Tesla, but I don't really talk about it that much because it's $6,000 at a minimum or $15,000 in the self-driving package, but there is no option for auto lane change in here. So you're always gonna have to do that yourself. So I'm gonna re-enter. I'm in both cruise control and now auto steer. I'm gonna crank up my speed, at least the top speed. And yeah, this is doing a great job. In order to truly review a self-driving system like this, you kind of have to spend a long time and spend a lot of miles with it because I live in the Los Angeles area and that's oftentimes where these systems can do really well is where they have been tested a lot and where people have tested them a lot or where they mapped all the roads. So you can't really know for sure if this is gonna be perfect in your area or not. Oh, keep hands on the steering wheel. They're there, so I'm squeezing it. What about turning force? Interesting. It seems like it does need turning force. So overall, this is doing a really great job right now. I can't really ask it to do much better. Uh, the only thing is it would be nice if the controls were a little simplified because at this point, I still don't entirely know what the best method is to get out of this system. If I should turn them off individually, if I should press just one thing. And you can also use just auto steer where you're still pressing on the accelerator. So it can be a little bit more confusing than other systems. But all that said, it's performing well for me right now, and hopefully it'll be very good in other situations as well. It's definitely braking better than Teslas do. I will say that right now. It does feel like I'm getting a little close to the back of this truck, but it's creeping along. I'm at a following distance of three, and it sees it. I can see it on screen that it sees that there's a car right there. This is too close for me though. I'm gonna hit the brakes. One sort of odd thing that I'm noticing is every time I engage the cruise control, where it's an adaptive cruise control, it says iPedal is turned off. And to me, that would indicate that it's not using regen braking and it's only going between accelerating and pressing the actual brakes, which is actually gonna be less efficient for you. If you're on a very long drive, if you're not using regen braking at all, which it sounds like the system isn't when it's auto driving, then you're actually gonna be getting less range out of the battery because it's not using the braking to put energy back into the battery. And now iPedal just turned back on because I got out of that mode. Overall, the GV60 is great to drive. It's not the quickest electric car you could buy. It's not the best for performance and handling, but it's great to drive and be driven in. It brings exactly what you want in an electric car. One complaint I would have is with one pedal driving. I already talked about how it turns that off in reverse, but it's also not quite strong enough to always come to a full stop. I'm used to Tesla and Rivian one pedal driving, and these are more reliable when coming to a full stop. The GV60 still feels like it can do one pedal driving, but isn't designed explicitly for it.
Regarding charging, the GV60 is going to be best charged at home. That's the case with any EV, and if you can do that, it will end up saving you a ton of time. When charging elsewhere or on a road trip, the GV60 can do speeds up to 350 kilowatts. This matches the Ionic 5 and is very impressive, beating Tesla's current peak of 250 kilowatts, but it's worth noting that you have to find the right charger and circumstance to get those charging speeds. I've had quite a rough time with third-party chargers in my Rivian R1T, so it's actually pretty hard to fully recommend an EV like the GV60, with a 248 mile EPA range in ideal circumstances if you plan to road trip a lot. If that's your plan, you will likely run into charging issues or need to really learn how to find the right chargers. That said, as a commuter and daily driver, it's a fantastic vehicle and you'll have no issues charging at home overnight with the right charger. Additionally, the GV60 has a vehicle to load feature. Their included adapter allows you to use the car as a battery to power various AC devices. This is something that many electric cars surprisingly don't deliver, so it's great to see on the GV60. Overall, the GV60 takes a lot of the good about the Ionic 5 and improves on what I didn't like about the Ionic 5. It feels like a car that justifies its price, although it is facing some tough competition in its price range and EPA range. The Mustang Mach-E starts at $46,000, around $13,000 less for a similar driving range, and a similarly priced Mach-E can get a range up to 312 miles. The Model Y gets a 330 mile EPA range, 82 miles more, and starts $4,000 cheaper today. So there's there's definitely some competition for the Genesis GV60 with the core features an EV should deliver, and I'd say its biggest weakness is its range. If that's not a concern for you though, and you like the features it delivers, it could be a great option for you. Genesis is a relatively new name, and I'm glad to see Hyundai making this car. Overall, I'm thrilled every time there is a new competitive EV coming to market, so I can't wait to see how this car may improve in the years to come. What are your thoughts though? Is the interior of the GV60 exactly what you want, or too much? Leave a comment below to let me know your thoughts. In the meantime, if you want to see my full review of the 2022 Tesla Model Y, you can check out that video linked up here or in the description below. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.